and after a long journey, we finally come to the final anime we'll be covering for this month in our Summer of RPG Anime, and it's on one recent RPG series I hold close to my heart as much as the others I talked about. That's right folks, we are going to be talking about Valkyria Chronicles, and I had high hopes for this one. After watching that series that shall never be named ever again. Created by Sega, Valkyria Chronicles was released on the PlayStation 3 in 2008, and only recently for Microsoft Windows based PCs via Steam in 2014. Upon its release, many reviewers praised the game highly, and it even won many awards. This success then sealed itself as a franchise and they released two more sequels on the PSP. For some insane reason? Though while the first sequel saw an English release, the third one which was a prequel that took place during the events of the first one, did not, and is most likely not going to due to the second game's poor sales, which still leaves me gutted to this day. While technically different from the norm as RPGs go, this series was a tactical role-playing game with third-person shooter elements that gave the player different battle skirmishes to play through within an awesome war story, and each battle gave you set objectives to complete while also trying to keep your soldiers alive, who were all unique with their own personalities. The battles would usually be handled by the player choosing a soldier on the map and then moving them with a set energy bar depicting how far they can move and take out the enemy with many tactical ways to handle each battle. The first game in the franchise was one of my modern RPG addictions I ever had. Not only from its fun tactical battle system that made it a blast to play, but also because of its story with many likeable characters that I grew attached to, including the not important side characters you could recruit that brimmed with personalities of their own. Sadly, while the sequels did keep its gameplay elements, the first sequel was just a mess of ideas that needed changes badly from its setting, execution of the main villains, and maybe should have taken many characters you could recruit back to the drawing board. While the third one never got an English release, which still gets on my nerves because this one looks and feels superior as a sequel already, from its premise alone. Though I am going to be honest, the game would sell anyway, just because of the badass rocket launcher toting old lady. The game sells itself. The series also spawned three manga adaptations, all written by Sega themselves, and of course an anime series which is our very subject I'll be sharing with you all today. Valkyria Chronicles was a 26 episode series produced by Aniplex's A1 Pictures, that premiered on Japanese airways between April and September in 2009, and within the first four months of airing, began to release DVD volumes spanning from 2009 and ending in 2010, releasing nine volumes in total. Though they also created a few OVAs, but they are quite frankly only extras for the fans to enjoy and are not part of the main series, so we will not be covering those. Anyway, enough of that nerdy jibber-jabber, and let's actually get into the story. Loosely based on the video game of the same name, the story takes place upon the continent of Europa, where the small country of Gallia finds itself on the brink of war with its neighbouring country, the Imperial Alliance, who hopes to use Gallia's resources in their war effort against the equally large Atlantic Federation in order to get more Ragnite, a precious ore they desperately want more of for their country. Reacting to this imminent threat, the small town of Rule begins evacuating its citizens, where we meet our main female lead, Alicia Melchiot, a baker who has joined the town watch to protect the town's people, and eventually meets up with the suspicious main male protagonist, Welkin Gunther, who is suspected of being a spy for the Imperials. However, at the same time, Imperial soldiers begin to invade Brule forcing Alicia, Welkin, and his sister Isara to fight for not only their lives but also for everyone in the town. After they all escape thanks to a tank left by Welkin's father, called the Edelweiss, 
both Welkin and Alicia join the militia in order to bring an end to the war and thus begins their newly appointed positions within Squad 7 as Commander and Second in Command respectively. Just like the last anime I covered, the anime was similar to the original video game in plot structure, but small details were changed to suit its adaptation. The changes I've arranged from how said situations and scenarios would happen, to additions of completely new scenes and even entire episodes original to the anime, along with new characters, which made the anime series that much more enjoyable, and dare I say, I actually like the differences at times. Not that I am saying all the changes were perfect. While yes, I did like the differences between the original video game and the anime, there were times I found that I disliked certain changes to the details or retooling of scenes. For example, in the original video game when Alicia meets Isara in the story for the first time, she instantly knew who she was due to the fact that Alicia lived in the small town most of her life and knows everyone. However, the anime makes her ignorant of Isara's existence and even pulls a gun on her because she didn't know who she was, which is stupid considering it's a small town and would be impossible for her to not know who Isara was. Granted, it makes sense considering for them to hide Isara due to her origins of being a Darkson. Yes, it's one of those plot lines, but a well-executed one. But at the same time, if you knew Welkin and his father, you would probably call Codswall upon this detail. So this was one of the few small details I just couldn't get behind. But compared to the last anime we talked about, I felt the changes made didn't ruin the story or its characters. It even made it hard for me to choose between the original video game and anime adaptation just because they both handled things so differently that I am still swayed from one side to the other on which one executed parts of the story better. However, when it comes to the characters, our main leads while still having what made them likeable was subtly changed. Welkin, while still logical and easily lost in thought whenever it comes to nature and science, had his latter trait amplified to be even more oblivious to his surroundings, that it almost makes him look kinda dumb at the start of the series. While Alicia, strange enough, was made... Uh, more... well... anime. There is a term used to describe a character trait to the more Japanese-inclined viewer, and that term is Sundera. If I'm saying that wrong, I'm sorry which in translation to me means bitchy. Alicia kinda gave off that feeling at the start of the series, though in later episodes she was not as whiny. I really disliked this take on her character, as I felt it was getting too close to tropey territory. While yes, I will say in the original game she did have rare moments of outbursts or times when she showed slight annoyance, she was mainly a nice girl with a good heart, which is still in the anime, but where they differed was that she didn't act unfriendly towards Welkin, and was welcoming to getting to know him. Unlike the anime that depicted her as not wanting to so much deal with him, let alone be in the same room with him. Well, it was the feeling I got from the changes to her lines and reactions I was left with. Other than the main leads, other characters had changes too like one of Isara's major overarching motivations being completely axed from the anime, to even the antagonist getting more screen time. Some of it was a shame to see left out, but it was really nice to see what they added to it. The one awesome aspect I enjoyed the most was seeing the side characters. You see in the first game, the characters you recruited had their own personalities and quirks, that had advantages and disadvantages, but beyond that, they didn't really have any scenes or stories based around them, other than small text blurbs and a single DLC mission. In future sequels, side characters would get their own stories or arcs around them, so watching this anime, I thought this was a perfect opportunity for the creators to do what they couldn't do in the original. They kind of did, where side characters had either small scenes or great interactions with the main cast, that it's kind of a shame there wasn't more of them. 
I would have loved to have seen an episode based around them, but from what we got, I am willing to take it. Animation looks really good, well at least compared to the last anime I saw this month. Everything looked really well animated, whatever the situation, whether serene or intense, and despite the fact it couldn't recreate the beautiful watercolour canvas painting style from the game, it still looked really nice to watch, and it even gave off a sense that someone used a pencil for shading, which was a nice subtle touch. And the battles while few and far between, and some being short, were all good, and felt like there was weight in some of them, including the final battle that showed there was no mercy for any of the characters involved. Music-wise, they just reused the original soundtrack from the game, and I didn't have a problem with that, since the music was high quality sound to begin with, and it made sense to not redo any of the wonderful orchestra music. While the two opening and ending themes used in the anime are good enough, but for me, only the first opening caught my ear. Sadly, because there was no English release, it means this anime can only be experienced in its native language. While that is not a bad thing considering the Japanese voice actors did a good job in their roles, I find myself preferring the English voice cast from the original video game just because they suited the characters more. So all in all, the presentation was great all around in my mind's eye, though I still have a few things to say about it. To say it was a romance war story is a bit of a stretch as there really wasn't much war going on. Not only did they add more drama to certain situations, but also quite a few more budding romances to the already existing main love story everyone was expecting, and even changed one character to throw a love triangle wrench into the main romance of the story, which was not present in the original. While those are just extra details to the story, this worked to the anime's advantage, for it added just a little more to the characters for fans, who were not expecting such developments, and added extra weight to the dramatic moments. Though on the other hand, this is an anime we're talking about here, so there were some unnecessary subtle things thrown into the mix, that took me out of the viewing experience just because it didn't feel like Valkyria Chronicles at those small moments. These included over-exaggeration of character traits, two characters screaming while powering up for the final strike scenario, and the biggest tropey culprit, random perverted scene involving a character's panties. The latter was actually the last straw I had when watching this anime years ago and made me stop watching it because I didn't feel that particular scene represented the characters or the original game in a good light. But now that I came back to watch the anime series in full, I ended up finding that once I got past those scenes, that it was a fairly decent series to watch that has its own merit, as far as adaptations go. So with that said, I can happily say that this series can stand with its own strengths. Though it does have a few kinks in it, but otherwise, if you get a chance to see it, I would wholeheartedly recommend it, just because it's friendly to newcomers, and if you're a fan of the original, it's interesting to note the differences between the two. So it goes to show that if one is to present something in a new light, then they should remember all the parts that made it wonderful to begin with, and to never alter it drastically, all to keep the beloved Chronicles intact. Uh, well, that's another month of anime-based RPGs taken care of, and it was a lot of fun. I thank each and every one of you wonderful people for taking the time to listen to my nerdy babblings, and hope you all found my insights into these anime enjoyable. Maybe next year we will cover more anime based on RPGs, both beloved and obscure, if I can find any to share, that is. But for now, we must bid this summer of anime farewell, for like any adventure, whether good, bad, or eventful, they all must come to an end, and yet never forgotten within our hearts. Farewell, my comrades, and may you all stay in good health for when we return here again.
Hey folks, thanks for watching these belated Summer of Anime special videos I made, and hoped you had lots of fun watching them. If you've enjoyed these videos, then I would greatly appreciate it if you could give these videos a like and share them with your friends. And if you want to stay up to date with any videos I do on this channel, then you're always welcome to click that subscribe button. In relation to the Summer of Anime, why not go check out Fairies' 100th episode of Fanservice Fiesta? where I, along with many others, cameo in talking about a manga series unlike any you'll have heard before. Trust me on this one. And as for today's Video Cave's YouTube recommendation, Son of a Glitch showcases glitches within video games, both modern and retro, and are a lot of fun to see how he confuses the games, but also finds ways to see the game from a different perspective that you're not meant to see. And here is one video of showing off some amusing glitches in Fallout 4, which I have linked in this video. Once again, thank you all so much for watching. Hope you all have a wonderful day or evening wherever you are, and as always, take care.